So, just like to say, I'm delighted to be here as part of the AMIC conference and to uh, participate in this discussion about how to move the measurement agenda forward and to be here on behalf of PRSA uh, representing that organization. So, just like to first start and talk about generally about PRSA's commitment uh, to research and measurement over the years. Uh, as you all know, PRSA has been an organization dedicated to education and providing tools and resources to the practitioners in our industry um, to give them the knowledge, the language, and uh, the resources they need to effectively measure the work that we do as communicators and to also make the case uh, for the value that we bring to our clients' business. Obviously, they've done this through the business case for PR initiative uh, that they have set forth. Um, they entered a partnership uh, with AMIC, and through that partnership and with the establishment of uh, the standards for industry last year, Barcelona had been promoting research, measurement, and evaluation throughout the industry. Uh, in their own way, they have uh, commissioned task force in the past to uh, set kind of measurement recommendations for a variety of different tactics for public relations. Uh, many of the people who participated on the task force are here today. Uh, with that, they provided tools, uh, additional resources for practitioners, and have also created profiles with industry experts to allow them to demonstrate how their career has truly impacted business results for clients. So moving forward, and you know, in light of what we established last year at Barcelona, uh, one of the key things PRC is planning to do and continue to do is to incorporate AMX valid metrics into its business case studies. Uh, namely as a replacement for AVEs, but also to, to recognize that what we do as communicators is very varied and the metrics we use to measure ourselves need to be specific to our client goals and specific to our objectives. So as that PRSA has been collecting a number of award-winning case studies to kind of demonstrate how to best put uh, the valid metrics into practice, uh, one such case study here is uh, the haagen Loves Honeybees CSR campaign. Uh, it's a campaign that uh, my firm, Ketchum, had run. And thank you to Ruth uh, Pistena for her work in populating the different matrices. And I apologize to those of you who attended our session yesterday and probably already saw this slide. Uh, but I do think, and I think PRSA believes that this is a great case study example of how you can really apply the metrics to any type of campaign. Uh, some of the key things that we found in this particular study was uh, how we were really able to effectively measure across the communications channel with our target audience, but also through what we do as communicators, moving from uh, the creation of content, distributing that content, and then affecting target audiences. Uh, one thing we saw was uh, a raised awareness among the target audience uh, about the issue with honeybees in the US and seeing their vital role that they play to the agricultural process. Essentially, without honeybees, there wouldn't be any delicious ice cream for people to eat. So it was really nice to see that effect uh, as a desired outcome. But we were also able to isolate business results in this case. And what we saw was a 5.2% increase in the sale of ice cream in April of 2008, and a sustained growth of 4% uh, in sales from April to July during that year. So I guess the question before us and what we're trying to establish here is how do we move this forward? We have you know, a standard set of baseline principles and uh, that we agree are important for us. And, how we want to evaluate ourselves. So how do we take this forward? Um, I think, you know, demonstrated by the data David just presented that clearly it starts with education. It starts with educating not only our clients about the importance of measurement and evaluation, but also ourselves and providing uh, the knowledge and the tools uh, for the, pe the practitioners that are doing, you know, communications and public relations work for their clients on a daily basis. And that's what PRSA would like to see as part of the agenda moving forward and the role they play you know, through promotion, raising awareness of the importance of measuring uh, PR's value to develop tools and to continue to educate. It's more than, you know, 35 members and practitioners throughout the field. To work with organizations such as AMEC to refine and the standards that we set for ourselves and to continue to provide real life case studies such as the one I just showed you that can be used as an example to how to apply these uh, principles to the day-to-day -day work. So, thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, having been part of the debate that resulted in the Barcelona principles, um, 
ECO's members across 28 countries are rather pleased to be asked back, so it can't have gone that badly uh, last year. Um, we believe the Barcelona principles were a good and important step in laying the foundation, as David always mentioned, in terms of the widespread adoption of professional evaluation. And we're hoping and expecting that this week's debate will take us a step further towards that. Um, on a personal level, it's 12, 13 years since I worked with the IPR as a PRCA representative on the creation of the first PR planning and evaluation toolkit. And I'm hoping that we won't have to wait until I'm nearly <coughs> 60 in another 12 years for professional evaluation to be widespread. Um, the consultants challenge around evaluation. We do want to evaluate, really, I know none of you necessarily believe us, but we do. Um, but things just get in the way. I mean, it's difficult sometimes. Money, you want us to give you money from our fees to evaluate. That hurts deep down. That, you know, and I can see a few consultants in the audience. That makes us feel distressed. Um, some of us believe that our unique, fascinating, and totally pangalactic evaluation process will differentiate us in the eyes of the client, so we don't want to share that. Um, some of us aren't feeling that we're necessarily best placed to have that debate because we don't fully understand the available opportunities. Um, we're not sure what should be evaluated. Um, and often if the client says, can I have AVEs? We'll go, yeah, okay, if that protects the fee and uh, that's what you want. There's also, and it's came out of the research, there's a lack of methodologies that are consistent for us to use. And just sometimes, maybe a few of us are a bit scared of what the evaluation might show. What do we want to know, though, and by 2020? Um, has the campaign met the objectives? Has it worked? What worked well and what didn't? So where do we need to focus in the future? Um, how's it helped out the business? If we can link it back to the business, there's more fee coming our way. And the other thing is, how well did it compare with my colleagues, the in-house team and other competitive agencies? So I've watched the information I'm looking for. Again, it's quite self-centered, but some of it will be used to improve the uh, future work. So what do we want in 2020? I appreciate this isn't for everybody's taste. We'd like a standard approach to evaluation, a uh, framework and methodologies, and hopefully the next step on the Barcelona principles. It needs to be quantitative and qualitative. Oh, look at these bills coming through now. Um, it needs to cover social and traditional output, outcome, and outtake, as you'd expect. And it should provide us with valuable accumulation and normative data, which we've missed out on for so long. Um, and lastly, clients, consultants, and you guys, the evaluation industry as a whole, really would need to um, endorse it. We appreciate that some people may feel that's commoditizing the surface. Our argument would be that it, if you can get all campaigns evaluated, and I think our gut feel is something like 30 to 40% of campaigns around the world are not evaluated at all, um, that would be helpful. David's touching his watch, so I've got to speed up here. Um, we need those activities, though. Sorry. So it'd be easy for me to say, you guys set a standard, we'll use it. There are a couple of things we're doing to help you um, or work with you towards making that a reality. They need to cross 28 countries with varying levels of maturity. So part of it is we're running online training for all of our members through the PRCA's online training platform on how to make the Barcelona principles come to life. And um, that's working around a program we developed with AMEC in the UK. The last thing um, is building a consultancy management standard module. Um, CMS is used in 13 countries for people running agencies. Um, we developed the evaluation model. It works as part of a two yearly audit of a consultancy's behavior management practice by an independent. It's gonna be available to all consultancies, um, including in-house teams in the UK. And we'll be delivering a kite mark around that um, to delineate the fact that people are taking evaluation seriously. Um, and it is based around the value metrics that AMEC has developed. So the idea is we provide a framework, not necessarily methodologies, but a framework for agencies to work around. So small challenge, if you could just knock out the standard methodology and process for evaluation. Ideally, by the end of the year, that'd be great from our point of view. So, thank you very much. <laughs> It's an honor to be here representing the um, Institute for Public Relations and its Measurement Commission. And I should probably also tell those of you who don't know that the, uh, the f um, although IPR is branded as the Institute for Public Relations, its legal name is the <coughs> Foundation for Public Relations Research and Education. Uh, some of us wish they kept those two words um, in their title, but it makes for a very, very long one. Uh, the, um, the, uh, 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 IPR is uh, a, an independent foundation that's dedicated to, the, um, to um, um, exploring the science beneath the art of public relations, and it does this by supporting public relations research, 
uh, and mainstreaming this knowledge into practice through public relations education. Its measurement commission that was formed in um, the IPR itself is, is now in its 55th year. The measurement commission began in 1998 and it exists to um, establish standards and methods uh, for public relations research and measurement and to issue authoritative best practice um, uh, white papers. And the commission um, is comprised of uh, uh, members from what we call the four pillars of the um, research measurement and evaluation industry. And that would be the, um, the, the public relations firms, uh, the um, uh, academia, the um, research providers, and the, uh, and the client side. The, um, uh, the focus on, um, uh, on research within IPR uh, falls essentially into three areas. And these, these are the three areas of, of research that uh, uh, Professor Jim Grunig has uh, uh, so appropriately um, defined. One of those is uh, research that is um, used in public relations, another is research on public relations, and the third is research for public relations. The research in public relations involves uh, research on communication programs, the planning, the research, the, the, the measurement pieces. Research on public relations is our studies to help understand uh, what we do and how we do it, such as benchmarking best practices in the business of public relations. And then research for public relations, which is the basic research uh, the, the, with the social science underpinnings often borrowed from some of the other um, academic disciplines. The questions that um, IPR is currently posing to its uh, board of trustees, about 40 uh, members of the board of trustees, um, many of them uh, uh, CEOs or presidents of the major uh, public relations firms and uh, uh, another large group of them, senior vice presidents of, of, of corporate communication functions. But um, the questions that we're asking the board now are three. Uh, one, does the Grunig model of these three kinds of research still provide a valid construct for the profession's research agenda? Um, the second one is how should we balance involvement in basic research versus benchmarking and, um, and, and planning and measurement research? And uh, we're also asking them what big picture research topics they would add to this list to help them manage better. And some of the potential research topics that have, uh, that have uh, uh, developed in, in the preliminary discussion so far are, um, are shown on this, uh, uh, my, my, my final slide, um, what uh, changes behavior, how do different audiences think and what's important to them, uh, viewing the, um, the, the broader context for social media, what to measure and what that measurement means, restoring reputation against the backdrop of, um, of a loss of trust, what skills and um, qualifications should uh, influence our, our hiring in the public relations and communication industry, um, research models to enable us to predict the probability of, um, of various uh, outcomes, research on the business of public relations, and then um, two uh, uh, demographic uh, research questions, one dealing with diversity in our business <clears throat> and uh, the other um, understanding generational um, uh, differences. The Institute for, for Public Relations has worked cooperatively with others in the past, and we look forward to continuing this um, cooperation in the future. Thank you. What I would like to talk about is where I think AMEC should be going. And this may be a little bit of a tough love session. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, the first slide, which is great evidence for, um, for our debate, is that measurement is growing. These are some top line results that came from the Business Monitor study that AMEC runs every year with its members. It shows a very solid growth pattern. Uh, even if we take out some of the bragging potential in some of the, uh, the, the answers we got back, this is still a very healthy growth rate. Clients are clearly increasingly seeing the need for measurement. This conference grows every year and it contains more and more clients as we go forward. So the questions are not really about the need to justify measurement per se. It's going to be much more about what can it do for me and how can it best be done. Because many clients in our experience from my work with, with many of our members um, in AMEC and also our own clients, 
and business people I talk to is that actually there's a very little consensus about what constitutes best practice in measurement and that's a, that's a serious opportunity for AMEC in sessions like this that we can end up hopefully creating a base of credibility that will make measurement much more embedded as part of the communications toolkit than it has done up until now. Uh, clearly social media is one of the key drivers uh, for, um, for that growth. But it's not enough just to say social media is the answer and that will give us our growth and revenue as AMET members for the next 10 years. The question is what sort of insight are we going to provide our clients that will make our research that much stickier that it becomes invaluable? Because after all, if you're simply projecting data or, or, or delivering data to a client, two data providers may be very similar. There's very little differentiation. As we know from the market research world, which I, many of you know I keep banging on about as being a very successful example of a, an industry that's grown up based around credibility and research authority, you need to deliver more insight. The insight is what will give the, um, the, the flavor to the data that will enable clients to take much more uh, focused decisions. And the trick, I think, is for us to turn ourselves into an organization that doesn't think the same way that we thought 15 or 20 years ago. It isn't enough for us to be working around visibility and sentiment outputs as being the only measures that clients are interested in. They ain't. And one of the key areas that I think is important with this kind of conference, with this oops, set of uh, organizations present here, and most importantly, the next session on this panel with clients, is that we need to start listening about their, to their concerns, not projecting what we think are the best solutions. Even if they're nice ones that talk about brand and advocacy and all those good things. We have to up our game. It's an English expression. It just means you, know, you need to get better at what we do, fundamentally. Outputs by themselves don't cut it anymore. Clients want much more than that. If you stay with data, you stay tactical, you stay commodity. We need to embrace and actively engage with business outcomes as part of our research process. If we start from the other end, which is what do we need to measure as opposed to what can we measure, clients are going to take that much more notice of us. Most importantly, in my experience, in the past in marketing, they'll thank us and most importantly pay us for partnering, not simply for supplying. We have to start listening to clients much, much more closely. And we have to engage with clients and their business needs in such a way that we become an invaluable business partner. What that means is a bunch of stuff in red at the bottom, which I think will be self-explanatory. Don't just pay lip service to research standards, live them. That's what research companies do, and some of them are very big and much bigger than we are because of that. We need to up our speed of delivery with the increasing content uh, digitization and, and availability. That whole area of, of um, delay in delivering results to clients goes away. We need to integrate much more. We need to talk to a broader community, and one of my goals within AMEC is to ensure that our outreach doesn't simply go back towards monitoring companies, but it goes forward and outward to management consultancies, to marketing and brand strategists, and all of the other folk who are delivering marketing and data analytics, which really support business decision making. We need to be cleverer and more explicit about the way media analysis and media evaluation and communications research can inform other parts of the business. That's very important, I think, is to make us stickier to a broader range of, uh, of, of potential customers within client organizations. And at the end of the day, that market research mantra from data to wisdom to insight, or from data to knowledge to insight, must apply to our business as well. And if we can find standards that help us get to that mantra, I think that's what we should be aiming for. Thank you. And I'm here representing the, the Council of Public Relations Firms. Um, and earlier this year, uh, the, our new chair for this year, uh, Andy Polanski, who's the president at Weber Shandwick, laid out uh, a number of uh, key initiatives for the year uh, to be able to help propel the Council of PR Firms forward, one of which uh, is a measurement uh, initiative uh, that we started earlier this year. And a lot of it is uh, included this quote because it shows that there's a commitment from the Council to build on the Barcelona principles and to build on the measurement frameworks 
uh, that were already established by a number of groups. So the intent of, of what we're doing in the CPRF Measurement Committee is, is not to replace or counter the work that's already been done, but to build on top of it uh, with some of the needs that, that are explicitly expressed by uh, the agencies involved. Uh, a lot of what we're focused on is, is fueling the adoption of best practices and the adoption uh, of standards. Education is an important part of that, but I think adoption uh, hopefully goes a, a step further where, where we as agency leaders can help drive uh, the implementation of, of these, uh, this, this work uh, throughout our agencies, uh, but also contributing to the industry standards uh, development. Um, the group is composed of a number of agency research and analytics leaders. There's actually significant overlap with the IPR Measurement Commission and Amex US <coughs> Agency Working Group or North American Group uh, by design. Um, and there are two work groups that we formed for this year. Uh, not necessarily the, these are the perfect priorities for the long term, but that the two significant issues that we feel like we're facing now that require a lot of hard work uh, to be able to help propel us to 2020, for example. One is around engagement. Uh, and as we saw in the discussion yesterday, there's a lot of uh, discussion there, but uh, a lot of opportunity to drive some consensus. And this is an area from a public relations agency standpoint that we're seeing a lot, a lot of movement with clients and an expectation that the public relations discipline and what they're expecting from agencies is dramatically different today than it was three years ago or five years ago primarily because of digital and social media. Uh, and this is where we need to step up. And then ROI is another area that we as an we as agencies feel like it is absolutely critical uh, and drilling into to what that means for the imperatives going into 2020. Uh, the first one is, is kind of a, a general one um, and basically this comes from what we as agency leaders have seen that measurement by and large if you talk to most PR practitioners is something that they do at the end. All of us uh, in the agency world have received uh, the call from, a cl from an account team saying, hey, we just finished a program, can you help us measure it? Okay, yeah, maybe we can, but it would have been nice if we talked at the beginning of the program to uh, use some good data to be able to help define some smart outcomes and, and uh, have good benchmarking in place and then carry that through. The reality is that that is not the norm. The reality is that the norm is we do measurement at the end. And, uh, I think part of it is because we use the term measurement, which people see as a report card, and you get a report card at the end. Uh, what we're seeing in other disciplines, in digital and social media, for example, but across marketing and business, is an embrace of the notion of analytics. Uh, and so I think we're, we believe that if we start to move as an industry to thinking about measurement and analytics together, we can bake measurement and analytics throughout the program, so it's something that you do up front for planning, benchmarking, uh, and decision making. It's something that you do throughout the program for optimizing and decision making. It's something that you do at the end for evaluation. And I think this also dovetails with what Mike said about the time frames. Uh, the tradition of a quarterly media analysis report is wholly insufficient. Uh, we need metrics that are daily, weekly, monthly, uh, and uh, as we saw in the marketing mix model presentation yesterday, having that weekly data or, or at least monthly data is the key to really getting the frequency to show the business impact. The second imperative that we see uh, that we're investing time in is around engagement, and it's this huge shift from impressions or counting the eyeballs to engagement and showing the impact. And we see this as agencies as a tremendous shift uh, that's impacting our clients that is not necessarily known or understood across the marketing community. Uh, the Coca-Cola CMO had uh, a good piece, I think, in Advertising Age or, or, or Harvard Business Review recently uh, about this shift. Uh, and so we're starting to see discussion about it, but I think we as measurement leaders have an opportunity here to be able to help drive this shift and guide clients, guide account teams uh, through what this means and how it changes. Uh, as a very simple example, for the clients and account teams who are focused on traditional media metrics and, and looking at well, how efficiently they can reach a certain audience through traditional media, when they get into digital and social media, they always find that the metrics fall short because the numbers of the people who are reading a specific blog are 1,000 or 10,000 as opposed to the 100,000 or a million that might be reading some of the traditional or viewing some of the traditional uh, media. And so their numbers look like, hey, it's not worth investing in this, even though they know in their gut this is worthwhile to do. So uh, we need new metrics to be able to make this transition. And the last imperative is that we no longer as an industry can afford to continue to use ROI in a very loose way. 
Uh, you see in Professor Watson's research and a number of other uh, places where people will just throw around the term ROI and what they really are talking about is return, just general results, not necessarily a return on investment, or they're talking about 227 stories as an ROI or 400,000 fans as an ROI. Uh, and through the measurement uh, work that we've done to date, uh, we are trying to drive to a standard definition of ROI, which really gets to money in and money out, the pure financial type of evaluation of ROI, which if you go to any other business function within a company, that's the way that they're defining it. And the other thing that uh, I think we've discovered through our, our discussions is that actually the value of public relations goes beyond ROI. So we can't uh, pursue ROI as an exclusive thing, that the total value of PR uh, is actually greater than ROI. And we need to be able to help clients understand both that tangible ROI as well as the intangible value of PR that goes beyond that and combine the near term and the lasting benefits. So those are the three imperatives that from the Council of PR firm standpoint we see uh, are really critical going to this uh, 2020 debate.